Welcome everyone. My name is Leah and I'm the Vice President of the GMU Economic Society. Um, on behalf of the Econ Society, I'd like to thank everyone for um, coming out tonight and it's our last Econ Society event of the semester. Um, this event is also sponsored by FFF and the um, Atlas Sound Money Project. So I'd like to thank um, FFF and both the Sound Money Project for helping to put this event together. Um, without further ado, uh, Tom Duncan will be talking about the Sound Money Project and then we'll have Bart from FFF who will introduce the speaker. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Uh, I'd like to thank the Econ Society and the FFF for uh, letting Atlas get in on this. Uh, Atlas has started a sound money project recently um, where we're looking at the results of inflation due to the you know, over budget, the huge deficits and all of that that government is currently running. And uh, sort of one of our main speaking points here is the uh, Sound Money Essay Contest. I have put some information up there on the table. Uh, the due date is January 15th. It's got a top prize of $5,000 for those of you who feel like writing something for it. And uh, that's basically it for me. I'm just really happy that you let us be a, be a part of this. So uh, here's Bart from the FFF. Well, thank you, and uh, welcome to the last installment of the Economic Liberty Lecture Series for the fall semester here. Uh, my name is Bart Frazier, and I'm Program Director at the Future Freedom Foundation. Uh, for those of you not familiar with FFF, we are a nonprofit libertarian educational foundation whose mission is to spread the ideas of liberty. Um, we do so through a variety of media, uh, including our flagship print journal, uh, Freedom Daily, uh, which you can get samples of uh, up in the, the display at the top of the stairs here. Uh, you can also subscribe at our website, FFF.org. Uh, we also spread the ideas of liberty on the Internet, which is actually where most of our activity takes place these days. Uh, we have what we consider to be the finest libertarian uh, uh, Internet newsletter that you can get. It's free for the asking. Uh, FFF email update. Uh, again, you can sign up for that uh, at the display or just send an email uh, to FFF at FFF.org uh, with subscribe uh, in the subject line. Uh, we also uh, spread the ideas of liberty uh, through venues such as this. Uh, we put on several conferences uh, and we've been uh, sponsoring this Economic Liberty Lecture Series for quite some time now. Um, uh, and you can see those videos uh, at our website. If you go to the conference classroom at fff.org, you can see all the previous lectures uh, from this series, uh, as well as from our previous conferences. Uh, a few housekeeping notes uh, before we get started here. Uh, we're going to end a little early tonight because we're in this classroom and there's a class following. So uh, we're going to be uh, leaving here around 7 and the social at Brian's Grill is going to be directly af afterwards at 7.30 instead of 8 o'clock. Um, we have our talks lined up for next semester. Uh, in February, we're going to have Jeffrey Myron of Harvard, uh, Sheldon Richman, uh, who is editor of the Freeman uh, publication of the Foundation for Economic Education and also a senior fellow at the Future Freedom Foundation, uh, and Richard Ebling of Northwood uh, University. Uh, the topic of tonight's discussion uh, is central banking. Um, central banking has been in the, in the news quite a bit here recently. Um, the recent housing bubble uh, has been laid at the feet of the Fed by many. Uh, uh, also, I'm sure as many in this room are aware, uh, the money supply has recently exploded under the stewardship of our central bank, the Federal Reserve. Uh, and interestingly, uh, and a little bit uh, unorthodox in recent times, uh, Ron Paul has introduced a bill in Congress uh, to audit the Fed, uh, which has ruffled a few feathers up on Capitol Hill. And he's also uh, published a book uh, calling for the abolition of the Federal Reserve System. So there's a lot of stuff going on uh, pertaining to uh, central banking and money. And uh, we could not really uh, have a better speaker uh, tonight than Steve Horowitz to be talking about uh, these different topics. Um, Steve is uh, one of our own here. He's a graduate of George Mason University. Uh, he is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics at St. Lawrence University. 
Uh, he has done public, public policy research for the Mercatus Center, the Heartland Institute, Citizens for a Sound Economy, and the Cato Institute. He is the author of two books, uh, Micro Foundations and Microeconomics, an Austrian Perspective, and also Monetary Evolution, Free Banking, and Economic Order. And the title of his speech this evening is, Do We Really Need a Central Bank? Uh, please welcome Steve Horowitz. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, thanks to Leah and the undergrad uh, Econ Society, thanks to the FFF, thanks to the folks at Atlas, uh, thanks actually to the Mercatus Center too for helping out. Um, I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, as Bart said, the title of my talk tonight is Do We Really Need a Central Bank? And I'm very tempted to just say no, thank you very much, good night. As a friend of mine said, um, that's probably too short. He said you could make it longer by saying hell no, uh, but I don't think that's going to work either. So I actually am going <laughs> to do more than, than just that. And hopefully what I'm going to do is, is explain why the answer to that question is no uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, as Bart noted in his introduction, there has been this recent surge of interest in the Fed. And, and I would say not just interest, but as, as his comments suggested, critical interest in the Fed. Um, and as, as again, as he said, Ron Paul is a part of that, and the Ron Paul cam presidential campaign and the issues that he raised there uh, certainly got the Fed on people's uh, radar screen. Um, and now the legislation that he's put in front of Congress, the, both the transparency and the audit legislation, have also brought questions about the Fed front and center. The bailouts, the recession, the housing bubble, all those things have again put the Fed at the center of some conversation. And there's even been some media coverage. There's a really good uh, story in the November issue of Reason Magazine on criticism about the Fed that if you haven't seen that, it's up on their website, I think, now too, that you should probably take a look at. That was a, that, and not just because they interviewed me for it. It happens to be a very good story uh, nonetheless. So that's, so that's, I think, worth looking at too. What's interesting, though, about all of this coverage is that criticism of the Fed has become mainstream. For years and years and years, for the 20th century and into the 21st, criticism of the Fed was really thought to be the province of a few libertarians and a lot of nut jobs. Okay? And that now, criticism of the Fed has moved out of just being uh, that province and in, in many ways into the mainstream. But one of the things I want to start by talking about th this evening is that even though it's becoming, getting into the mainstream press and into the con halls of Congress in a number of ways, there's still a perception out there that people who are really critical of the Fed are nut jobs or worse. And one of my goals today is to help you, especially the students, avoid being labeled as a nut job if you're critical of the Fed. You may not know this, the younger folks here, but the history of anti-Fed arguments is in fact kind of an ugly one. For most of US history, those arguments, the arguments against the Fed, have been dominated by voices like New World Order types with their talk of Jewish banker conspiracies, the Trilateral Commission, and world currencies, right? Titles like the creature from Jekyll Island, all these sorts of things um, suggest a kind of conspiracy theory or worse view of the Fed. Anti-Fed talk was like people who were afraid of fluoride in the water, the realm of crazy right-wingers uh, like the John Birch Society, again, or worse. In the minds of many still today, criticisms of the Fed are heard through those perspectives. And the reality is, is that there still are a good number of these sorts of nut jobs, that's the technical term, out there making these kinds of arguments. Unfair as it might be, the burden is on us, those of us who are critics of the Fed, to make it clear that we're not part of that crowd, that we have serious, substantive, informed criticisms of the Fed. So how do we do that? How do we distinguish our arguments from those of the crazies? The answer, I think, is that we present the historical facts and the theoretical arguments carefully and thoroughly, and we offer feasible alternatives to central banking. You'll notice, by the way, that the craziest critics of the Fed often don't have an alternative. They're just critics, right? And we do this, we, we make these arguments, without assuming that those who created or currently run the Fed are evil, right? They might have been and might still be driven by self-interest, Right? But that's fine to say. Self-interest isn't the same as evil. 
Aside from all the fact that this conspiracy theory talk about the Fed is just historically wrong, not to mention often anti-Semitic, it isn't necessary. You can find all kinds of problems with the Fed and central banks in general just by knowing some good economics and some real history. So my task in the next 45 or 50 minutes or so is to try to put all this on the table. And I'm going to do it really in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the history of U.S. banking up through the creation of the Fed. And I think that's important because it's important to understand why people thought we needed a Fed and why critics of the Fed like myself would argue we didn't need the Fed because that history was misunderstood. Second, I want to talk about the sort of the Fed's track record since its creation, right? Um, what has it done? How has it screwed up? And we'll talk a little bit about the current recession there too. And then third, I want to talk about why we shouldn't expect central banks to work and what the alternative might be. So sort of some, some pre-Fed history, some post-Fed history, and then sort of uh, some, some theory and, some, and an alternative view of what banking might look like without, without a central bank. Okay? And I think I can do that in about 45 or 50 minutes. So let me talk a little bit about the pre-Fed history of, the, of, of banking in the United States. First thing you need to know is that we, the United States, has never had a free market in banking. There never was laissez-faire in banking in the United States, ever, period, end of sentence. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Banking has always been regulated, at least at the state level. For one thing, interstate banking in the United States didn't exist really until late into the 20th century. And some states, historically, didn't even allow banks to operate branches of, of the bank within the, the state they were chartered in. You could open one office, that's it. And a few states early on in, in the history of the U.S. prohibited banking, as we know it anyway, altogether. More importantly, in some ways, every state in the United States in the sort of late 18th and early 19th century required banks to obtain a politically granted charter. That is, if you wanted to open a bank, you had to go to the state government and beg them for a charter to open up. Those charters were granted on, on purely political grounds. There was no sort of objective criteria. Either they liked you or they didn't, or you had the right connections or you didn't. You got a charter or you didn't. So from day one, those kinds of regulations have been in place. So if someone wants to tell the story that we need a central bank, we needed the Federal Reserve because laissez-faire in banking failed, that's just wrong. You, you can promptly turn to them and say, no, where is this mythical laissez-faire to which you are, are pointing? By the way, it's interesting that we see that argument recurring these days, right, as people are pointing to supposed deregulation of the financial system over the last 10 or 15 years as a cause of the recession. And my response to that is, what deregulation are you talking about? Have you seen what the Federal Register looks like? Right? There's no deregulation there. So same sort of argument keeps cropping up and cropping up. In addition, early on in U.S. history, we had the first and second bank of the United States. So from 1791 to 1811, we had the first bank of the United States. It, it was, uh, it, its charter was not renewed originally, and then we had the second bank of the United States, which was created in 1816. Its charter ran out in 1836. And again, as you hopefully know from, a US, from U.S. history classes, that was all Andrew Jackson and all the debates over the bank in the mid-1830s. Um, those two banks weren't really central banks as we know them today. Um, they were uh, one-fifth owned by the government. Uh, they served mostly as a bank for the government. They had very limited monetary powers. They certainly didn't control the money supply in the way that banks today do, uh, though they had, again, some they did create a little bit of money and had some limited powers there. There was, as, as I suggested with the Jacksonian stuff, there was a great deal of debate over these two banks, right, whether they worked, whether they didn't work, what was good about them, what wasn't good about them. And finally, in that Jackson period in the mid-1830s, uh, the sort of uh, sense of the public was that these were not a good idea. Uh, they were uh, antithetical to populist principles, and so the bank's charter in 1836 was not, the second bank's charter was not renewed. This threw banking in the United States back into the laps of the individual states. And in eight, between 1836 and 1863, th that period of about 25 years or so is known historically as the free banking era. And I want to say something about that, because that term free banking has another meaning that I'm going to talk about later, uh, later this afternoon. By free banking here, okay, what was meant was that a number of states began to say, look, 
Instead of us granting charters based on you knowing the right people politically and through this very shady process, we're simply going to say, here are the criteria you have to meet if you want to be a bank. You need a certain level of capital. You need certain things on your board of directors, so, and so on and so forth. If you meet those listed criteria, we'll give you a charter, and you can become a bank. And this was the idea of free banking. And really, the better name for it would be free entry into the banking business. And two states pioneered this, by the way, the two states I've lived in for the vast majority of my life, uh, Michigan and New York. And those two states uh, began a process that quickly spread to other states, where other states began to get rid of their old political charter systems and began to open up entry into the banking business. This was good, okay? It increased the number of banks. It provided more banking services to the public. It depoliticized the process. All of these things were good. But these banks were, again, not unregulated. Those free banks, the, the free banks during this period were subject to a number of regulations at the state level. And let me mention three, because these three regulations are the ones that play the most crucial role throughout the 19th century, throughout the era before the Fed. Those regulations are, first of all, limits on branching. Again, some states allowed banks to operate branches within the state. Some didn't. No state allowed their banks to operate across state lines. The United States has always had, even really up to the mid-20th century, a system of banks that was state by state by state. So that's one set of regulations, and an important set of regulations for a number of reasons. Banks also had, were faced with reserve requirements. The individual states mandated that banks hold a certain percentage of reserves, hold certain items as reserves. They varied from state to state, but banks, again, were forced to hold certain sorts of things uh, as, as reserves. Frequently, by the way, well, let, let me come back to that later. So, so reserve requirements being the second thing. The third and the least known of those regulations were what, what were called collateral requirements for currency. Banks at the time, if you had paper currency at the time, that paper currency was issued by an individual bank. There was no central bank printing up currency. Currency was printed by the individual banks. That currency was usually redeemable in gold or sometimes silver. But the states had additional requirements they put on banks. They said to be doubly, triply safe, that banks had to hold uh, in their assets, as part of their portfolio, some form of collateral, just in case the bank went under. That way, those notes could be redeemed not just for the gold or silver, but could be cashed in for that collateral. For most states, that collateral consisted of bonds from that state government. So banks were required to buy up state bonds uh, and, 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 and as to hold as collateral. Now you can understand why state governments would think this was a really good deal, because they had a captive market for their bonds. They basically require, if you want to do business as a bank, great. You want to give, you, your customers want to use hand-to-hand -hand paper currency, great. Only way you can do it, buy up our bonds. Pretty good deal, okay? A few states, by the way, included in that requirement, not just state government bonds, but sometimes things like railroad bonds, right? So here you go, you're a railroad, you want to open up an estate, that's a pretty good deal if you can get it, right? We'll issue bonds to finance my railroad, and then we'll, get, we'll convince the state legislator to, legislature to require the banks to buy our bonds as collateral. Pretty good deal, okay? In any case, the point here is, is that the issuance of paper currency in this case was not, again, unregulated, that the individual states put these sorts of collateral requirements in place. Throughout that period of the 18, from eight, the 1830s to up to 18, mid-1860s, um, this system actually worked fairly well. It had some problems. There were a few currency panics and things like this, but none of them were especially severe. Um, there are some myths about this era that I, I don't have time to go into in, in, in a great amount of detail, but I'll just mention one. Uh, what, people, what people argued about this era was that the problem were what they called wildcat banks. Okay. And the idea behind a wildcat bank was, was this. You could, pe what people said about this era was, well, what banks used to do is that they would open an office out in the woods where the wildcats were, right? That's where the wildcat banking comes from. They'd issue a whole bunch of paper currency, bring it into town, and people would spend it. And then by the time they could go find the bank out in the woods to redeem the currency, right, the bank would, had closed up shop and was gone. And so one of the stories people tell about why this era was so bad and why we can't have uh, why we need a central bank, why we can't have banks producing their own currency, is we'll get this kind of wildcat banking. 
Well, it turns out later empirical work by a number of different economists have, have established that historically this just didn't happen very often at all and that the total losses due to this kind of behavior were in fact rather minimal. So it's a very convenient story that people sometimes told, but later investigations in the 1980s and 90s, there were a number of papers on this, demonstrated that, the, that this was not a significant problem. Um, and it's worth noting that this problem was more severe in states that had larger limits on branch banking, because the argument was then there were all these different banks you could never know. States that allowed banks to operate branches uh, tended to have fewer banks that people knew better. And so when a new bank came in and started issuing all these currency, people go, who's this, right? And the states with, with more extensive branching and larger banks tended to have better developed networks of uh, relationships among banks that, that would enable them to sort of spot an interloper like this very quickly. So this story doesn't seem to hold much, hold much weight, but it is a myth that you sometimes hear. But what was more interesting about this was that this, was, again, was a good deal for the state governments because they had this captive market for their bonds. And then come, along comes the early 1860s. So what's happening in the early 1860s? Big US historical event. Civil War, good, I hope we're on the same page there. Civil War comes along. <coughs> You're the federal government. You gotta pay for this, the union government. You gotta pay for this thing, all right? One of the interesting things historically, and I, I don't have time again to explore this in much detail, but. I have in other talks you can find on the web. Um, there is a long co historical connection between war and central banking, and that the, the, the history of the increased government power over banking is often the history of the need for governments, at least their perceived need by governments, to raise revenue to fight wars. And it's perhaps, I mean, I, one of the things I do when I teach money in banking is when I start this historical material, I put a whole bunch of dates on the board. 1811 through 1816, 1863, 1914, uh, 19, uh, then in parentheses, 1934, and then 1971. And I asked my students, what do all these dates have in common? And usually someone says, aren't they all wars, times of war? And the 1934, right, is the middle of the Great Depression. That's a metaphorical war. It's not a literal war, but it is a metaphorical war. And that's right. They are all times of war. But there are also times of major increases in the U.S. government, federal government's role in the banking system. That's not a coincidence. And so the story of the Civil War is, is one of the better examples of this. So what happens? The federal government says, well, geez, we need to raise revenue. Look at what those states are doing. Let's get in on the act. And so in the early 1860s, for the first time ever, the federal government decided to start chartering banks. Instead of going to the state, you could go to the federal government. That's why, by the way, banks are First National Bank of Detroit or Second National Bank of St. Louis or something like that, because they were the first national bank chartered in, in Detroit or St. Louis or wherever. So the federal government said, okay, we'll offer charters, all right? And the deal, of course, was that they imposed the same rules on the federally chartered banks as the state banks did, which is reserve requirements, no branching, and now you had to buy federal government bonds if you wanted to issue currency. Why? Well, pretty cool. You could pay for the Civil War that way, right? You had to force these banks to buy up the bonds, they pay for the war. There was only one problem. Nobody wanted one. The bank said, well, what's the gain for us? We've got these state charters, why bother? And that's when Congress got clever. Congress said, well, we can solve that problem easily enough. And they passed a law that put a 10% tax on the note issues of state chartered banks. And so the state chartered bank says, oh, that's different. <laughs> if you're going to force us to pay a 10% tax on our note issues, oh, we'll take one of those federal charters. Thank you very much. And so a bunch of banks began to switch over from the state to the federal charters, with the result being they began to buy up these bonds. The federal government has a market for its, for its bonds. Uh, pretty, pretty clever. The problem with this system, well, this system, by the way, from 1863 until 1913 is known as the national banking system, perhaps for obvious reasons, that we had these nationally chartered banks. And many state chartered banks went by the wayside. There were still some that stuck around. They just tended not to issue paper currency. Most of the US paper currency supply during this period was issued by the federally chartered banks. Again, they were subject to the same sorts of regulations, um, limits on branching, bond collateral requirements, but also the reserve requirements changed a bit too. And the interesting thing that happened here was that the reserve requirements began to resemble a pyramid. If you were a bank operating, say, out in the country, not in a major city, um, you, part of your requirement was to hold a deposit at a bank in one of the major cities, like Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, New York, whatever. Um, 
The banks that operated in those major cities, with the exception of New York, were required to hold deposits in banks in New York City. Okay? The New York City banks obviously were sort of at the top, or if you want to think of it this way, at the bottom of this pyramid. They were sort of the, the stopgap. They were the last, and they had a heavier gold reserve requirement than did the other banks. One of the interesting things about this is that if there was trouble out in the countryside, and the country banks had to start giving, you know, were, were faced with demands for gold from their customers, and they had to start giving out gold, the only way they could get more gold was to go to the banks in the cities. Banks in the cities see their gold go away. The only way they can get more is go to the banks in New York City. New York City had nowhere to turn. Without that gold, either they had to import some, which was expensive, or they had to start shrinking down how much money they were creating. And you could see a kind of ripple effect across the whole economy. And in fact, there were several of these sorts of panics during the national banking system, uh, 1884 being one of them. The two we know the most about and that were the biggest were in 1893 and 1907. And essentially what happened, the 1907 one's the easier story to tell in some ways, um, there was a big increase in the demand for paper money during the autumn harvest time, about now, maybe it was October, it was er early, middle October. The banks out in the country, the only way they could meet that demand for currency was to go out and acquire more federal government bonds. Because they couldn't print more currency without having the bonds as collateral. Only problem is, everybody's trying to buy those government bonds, that bids up the price, that makes it more expensive, perhaps not worth doing. Not only that, there was a fairly fixed supply of those bonds, and sometimes they were difficult to find. Not only that, if you could even buy them, then what you had to do was ship them to Washington, to the control of the currencies office, who then printed your actual currency for you and shipped it back to you. That process could take like six weeks. You got customers lining up. You can't find those bonds. You can't give them paper currency. You can't wait six weeks for this process to work. What do you do? Well, you start giving out gold. You start giving out gold instead of currency. You've got to get more gold from the city banks. It's, and we get this kind of ripple effect through the system that caused these panics. 1907, this was compounded by problems with some New York City banks, in particular the trusts, who, had all, who were behaving uh, not so nicely and had all kinds of uh, fishy connections and things like that, that, that led to people in New York City uh, running on the banks. By the way, bank runs in, at the time, you know, you have this vision of sort of panicky customers, you know, screaming and knocking down the barricades. They were actually pretty tame. People lined up. They, it was like waiting for concert tickets, right? You lined up, right? You brought something to eat. You waited, okay? If you were rich, you paid someone else to stand in line for you. So this whole notion of a bank run that we think of literally people running on the bank, not the case at all. It was a pretty, pretty reasonable, rational process. Um, one of the other things that happened during the Panic of 1907 and in 1893 is that banks began to break the law. They basically began to issue paper currency without the required bonds behind them, uh, but they did it in ways that made it not really look like currency. And there were all kinds of other weird currency substitutes. People used subway tokens for money. People used, like, you know, tickets you'd get at the circus for money. Um, they would take cashier's checks, have it made out to someone. You'd sign the back and endorse it. And then you'd give it to someone, and they'd give it to someone else and endorse it. So all these weird money substitutes came into be being because of these shortages created not by laissez-faire, but by the bad regulations of the system. So not surprisingly, people began, really after the 1893 panic, to say, we got to do something about this. We got to change this system so that we don't have these problems. There were a number of reform proposals put forward, particularly between 1893 and 1907. Most of those proposals said, get rid of the bond collateral requirements and allow banks to branch across state lines. If you do those things, you'll solve the problem. And particularly, the Midwestern bankers, were the, they were the heroes in this story. They were the ones that said this. The small country bankers did not like branch banking. Why? They were afraid the big city banks and the New York banks would come in, buy them up, and buy up the competition and monopolize everything, which turns out, which wouldn't have happened, but they were understandably, perhaps, afraid of that. The New York City banks weren't crazy about this either. They, they kind of liked the current system. It gave them some power. They were worried that if, that if uh, there was more branching in asset currency, the Midwest bankers might get stronger and threaten them. So all these proposals kept going to Congress and being debated. But what happened was that the people who were opposed to branch banking just outnumbered everybody else. If you think about the US at the time, it was a very agrarian country. And you think about the Senate in particular, where every state has two votes. All of the rural 
agricultural states with all these sort of small banks were able to keep voting down every proposal that involved liberalizing the branch banking laws. So a number of proposals went forward between 1893 and 1907. They kept getting knocked down. The panic of 1907 comes along. It's pretty bad. J.P. Morgan has to step in. You know, he's, he's sort of the bailout guy of the, of the early 20th, 20th century. He steps in with a whole bunch of gold, helps save the system. People say, this is it. Something's got to change. But they realize these, other, these old proposals won't work. They can't have the asset currency and branching proposals. And one of the results is that people stop talking about the asset currency, stop talking about getting rid of these bond collateral requirements, because they were connected with the branching things. So notice what's happened here. Those proposals, if we'd done that, liberalized the branching laws, got rid of the bond collateral requirements, we would have solved about three quarters of the problems with the national banking system. But it didn't work, not because it was a bad economic proposal, because politically it couldn't carry the day. It didn't line up with the political self-interest of the small town bankers and their representatives, particularly in the Senate. So it's not that those proposals were wrong. It's that political self-interest blocked them. The result of this was that conversations about a central bank began to come to the forefront. People perceived rightly that the current system was problematic. But they didn't always diagnose the problem correctly. A lot of people in the early 20th century thought the problem was that we couldn't get reserves fast enough to where they needed to be. Thus, we needed to centralize those reserves. You ever wonder why our central bank's called the Federal Reserve System? That's the answer. The perception was that we needed to have some way of controlling those reserves from the center to make sure that they got to where they needed to be so that banks would have enough currency and so on and so forth. And so what happens? Well, people start talking about central banks. The Midwest bankers aren't happy about this. The small town bankers are OK with this on one condition, that the New York banks don't have control over it. The New York banks are willing to have a central bank if <laughs> they've got some control over it. The end result of all this was the Federal Reserve System, more or less as we know it now which is, as one person has said, the world's only, de at the time anyway, decentralized central bank. The Federal Reserve System was created with 12 district banks, right, in 12 cities across the country. By the way, if you look at those cities, they're all biased to the East Coast. Not surprisingly, that's where the population was at the time, right? And there's been these proposals over the year to sort of move feds around, right, and sort of make them better match the current population. You can guess that those haven't gone anywhere. Why? Who, who's going to have the biggest reason to oppose, you know, creating, you know, moving feds out of one city into another, right? The people in the city are going to lose it, right? And they keep arguing, they go to Congress and say, you can't get rid of the Federal Reserve of Richmond. Well, look at all the jobs that depend on it, right? Jobs for economists, we might know too, okay? So, so those, that, that, that change hasn't happened. But what we had was this 12 district banks. And these 12 district banks, by the way, are in fact technically private. They are owned by the banks in that district. And you oftentimes see people making these claims. Well, you see, it's the, it's the bankers. It's the private bankers who run our government. Well, not really, OK? Yeah, they're private, but they've always had a great deal of public privilege in the form of monopolies and other sorts of privileges. More importantly, as I'll get to in a minute, the power is now, in, in, at the creation of the Fed in 1913, the power was more decentralized than it is today. Now the power sits largely in Washington with the Federal Open Market Committee and the board. Okay? But at the time, the district banks did have a lot more power. But the power they had was not just, they weren't just private the same way Walmart is, let's say. Okay? They were private with public privileges. So if anything, it was an early form of corporatism. And in fact, what it really was, to be honest with you, is that this, the Fed was a classic product of the progressive era. And the, the belief people had at the time that the only way to solve economic and social problems was to find experts who could solve those problems top down using government, to, using the bureaucracy. The whole way of thinking about scientific management of social problems that arose in the late 19th and early 20th century, that explains the Fed. You don't need to invoke all this other craziness. Here you had a problem, right, the panics. You had a misdiagnosis of that problem. 
as people's ideological beliefs were, well, at the top part of the progressive era was that sort of markets can't self-correct, that markets are, 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 you can't leave things to the marketplace. Um, and so they looked at this that wasn't scientifically managed from the top and simply said, ah, see, the markets failed. We need to intervene more heavily, right, with this, with this uh, centralized authority and bring that together with political self-interest. And you can tell the story of why we have a central bank. Right? By the way, the irony of this is that the New York Fed did get a particularly prominent role at the creation of the Fed, and still today it has a distinctly prominent role. All the Fed's open market operations by which it buys and sells securities take place through the New York Fed, and the president of the New York Fed has a permanent seat on the Federal Open Market Committee that decides Fed policy. So the great historical irony here is that, that the small banks who agreed to the, the, small, the small bank state politicians who agreed to the central bank, the Fed, um, because they didn't think the New York Bank would have disproportionate power were wrong. They, they, they got it and still have it. My point, though, is simply this. You don't need to invoke mysterious conspiracies and the Illuminati and, you know, and, and why, why the eyes on the back of the dollar bill and all this kind of stuff to explain why we have a central bank. It's not backroom deals by Jewish bankers of the New World Order, right, or any of these folks, the Trilateral Commission. Okay? The story is no different from the one we will tell about how, we tell all the time that, about how government grows. About Bob Higgs was here two months ago. He told the story then. Government caused problems in the marketplace. Those problems were misdiagnosed. Proposed solutions that gave more power to private interests were supported, especially in a climate where people believed government in general was a good solution. The result was bigger government. Turning it into a deep, dark conspiracy theory makes you just sound paranoid and ignorant. Good social science and history is all you need to explain how we got it, the central bank, and why we don't need one. So now the question is, how's the Fed done? Right? We've had it now almost 100 years. Right? It's getting awful close to the 100th anniversary of the Fed, which I predict will be a cause for much celebration, <laughs> much of it misplaced, as we're going to see in the next few minutes. So how's the Fed done? Well, one of the first things the Fed did was generate some inflation during World War I. Didn't take long, okay? That inflation ended with, the, with a steep, though short, recession in 1920 and 21. Then what did we get? Well, the 1920s, argue a good number of economists, were, was a period of an, of an inflationary boom that led to what? The crash and the onset of the Great Depression. So the Fed's been in business from 1913 to 1929, 16 years. An inflation, a recession, a bigger inflation, and a bigger recession. Not so good. Okay. Not only that, 1929 rolls along. We have the stock market crash, the beginnings of what would have been a bad recession. But what does the Fed do? From 1930 to 1933, it allows the money supply to decline by 30%. And it turned what would have been, I think, a significant and but necessary correction, a bust, into a very deep and severe Great Depression. Remember, during the Great Depression, about one-third of U.S. banks failed. About 8,000 out of 20-some-odd thousand banks in the United States failed. Next time someone compares what we're going through right now to the Great Depression, you know how many banks failed this year? Anyone know? Approximately? About 100, yeah, 130, 140, something like that. Not good, by the way. That's not good, okay? But that's not 8,000. That's not even, you know, if you figure 8,000 over a three- or four-year period, that's 2,000 a year. We're not even in the same ballpark as far as bank failures go. By the way, other th while I'm making the point, current unemployment rate, 10.2%. Anyone know what the unemployment rate was at the worst of the Great Depression? 25, 26, depends how you count. Anyone know how many years the unemployment rate in the United States was over 10% during the Great Depression? 10 or 11, depending on how you count. Okay, so again, let's be clear, you know, what we're talking about. But the point relevant for this talk is it was the Fed's inflation and then the Fed's being asleep at the switch from 30 to 33 that were major factors in causing the Great Depression. These sorts of things are exactly what the Fed was intended, was created to prevent, and that it failed miserably, faced with its first severe challenge. By the way, how did the Fed respond to this, right? I mean, you know, what you'd like to see happen is that the Fed, you know, the Fed chairman stands up and says, you know what, you guys asked, you created us to, do, to solve a problem, we're incapable of solving it, you should close us down and try something different. When's the last time you heard a bureaucrat say that? <laughs> 
What do they usually say? We need more money or we need more power. And that's exactly what the Fed said. Well, if we'd had more power, we could have stopped it. Okay? And so in 1934 and 1935, they got it. We decoupled the, the dollar from gold, at least domestically. And in the Banking Act of 1935, gave the, reshuffled the power structure of the Fed, putting more power in Washington, less power to the regional banks, and created the FOMC and gave the Fed the power to conduct open market operations and, and, and uh, attempt, anyway, to manipulate the money supply in a whole bunch of different ways. So what's the result of those new powers? What we'll gently call post-World War II instability. The average inflation rate since World War II has been higher than ever in, in the history of the United States, and the costs of inflation are real, right? The costs of inflation hurt you and I and everybody else in a whole different, whole variety of ways. Uh, we can also mention a number of recessions since World War II. If we counted them all, it would be a long, longer list, but the major ones of 73, 74, of the early 80s, and now, of course, the Great Recession. All of these sorts of problems, inflation, recessions, are the kinds of things the Fed was created to prevent, or at least what, in theory, central banks are supposed to be preventing. And by the way, what's been the Fed's response to the current recession? If, if you said to the Fed, you know, you screwed up during the housing bubble, or how are you going to solve this recession? What are they saying? We need more powers. And by the way, this time they haven't even said we need more powers. They've just gone and taken them. Okay? Uh, one, of the, one of the really dirty secrets of the current situation is how many new powers the Fed has basically just asserted for itself without asking for any congressional approval or anything else. The Fed is doing things now it was never designed to do that were never part of its, its, its mandate, um, uh, everything from bailouts to buying other kinds of assets without asking for explicit congressional approval. And this has been done on the basis of one clause in the, in the, in the, in the statutory rule, the legislation that created the Fed that sort of, it's a, you know, it's an emergency powers clause, right? It was, the argument people make, it was never meant to do this, okay? But the Fed has kind of driven a truck through this thing and done pretty much whatever it's wanted to. Uh, the other thing, of course, giving the Fed this power to buy and sell government securities to open market operations gives them the power to monetize the debt. This gives them the, the, the ability to, for the F U.S. federal government to run more debt and the Fed to just turn that debt into dollars by buying it up itself as a way of increasing the money supply. Uh, the feedback effect of that, of course, is to say to politicians, go ahead and run more debt, because the central bank's there to buy it up, right, if you, if you need it. So the, the Fed's track record, even before the current recession, was pretty miserable. And just as, a, just as one point of comparison, um, if you look at the track record in, in countries, let's say, during the Great Depression, which didn't have, Canada, by the way, right, did not have a central bank until the mid-1930s, okay, 1935, 36. Anyone know how many banks failed in Canada during the 1920s and early 1930s while, while 8,000 were failing here? The answer is one or zero, depending on how you count. But yeah, one or zero, okay? Why? One reason, Canada always had nationwide branch banking. You could always operate across nationwide. The U.S. was still stuck with all these small banks, many of them connected to agriculture. So again, the, the sort of federal government and central bank intervention in the U.S. banking system was a cause of its, of its mess. Canada got through the Great Depression without the banking system problems we had, even though they didn't have a central bank, right? And you want someone to say, perhaps because they didn't have uh, a central bank. So consider the mess the Fed has us, has us in now, right? It was Fed inflation that fueled the housing boom of the, of the last decade. Um, and now we've, in the bust of that boom, the Fed has overreacted, uh, and it's, as Bart said, expanded the monetary base enormously, and the real fear of, of, of some nasty inflation in the future, that, that fear is, is, is quite real. The Fed's grabbed powers right and left that it never had or never should have. So the uprising of public reaction has been understandable. The Fed has become a very giant gorilla in the room, and people are not happy. So let me say a few words about why the Fed can't get the job done, having documented that it can't. Like other government attempts to centrally plan parts or all of the economy, the Fed, central banks in general, suffer from structural problems that prevent it from doing the job we'd like it to do. Let's assume, to keep things simple, that the Fed's job is to match the supply of money to the demand people have to hold that money, that that's its job. Now, this is a not, not all 
say Austrian economists would agree this is what the Fed should do. But just to keep things simple, I want to assume that's the Fed's job. How can it get this job done? Well, what's, what are the challenges it faces? Well, one of the challenges it faces is what we call knowledge problems. Okay? How does the Fed know what the demand for money is? By the time it estimates that demand, has that demand changed? Can the knowledge one need, would need to have to know that demand for money even be centralized? One of the things that Austrian economists talk about a lot is tacit knowledge, that the knowledge that matters for knowing the demand for any good, including money, is often a knowledge of a form that people themselves can't articulate. For example, how many of you can drive a stick shift, you know, a standard shift? All right, good. How many of you ever tried to teach someone else how to drive it? Good, all right, or we can remember being taught. What's the hardest thing to teach or learn about driving a stick? When to release the clutch. How do you know when to release the clutch? When you're supposed to, right? How do you know? Feel. You just know, right? Now, if I said to you, do you know when to release the clutch? You'd say, yeah, I know when to release the clutch. If I said to you, can you explain to me how you know when to release the clutch? You'd go, ugh. Right? And then when you're teaching someone, what happens? You say to them, they say, how do I know when to release the clutch? And you say, well, you'll feel it. OK, what happens? Well, they release too early. The car goes like this. The transmission falls out, right? No problem. OK? Or they release it too late, and the engine goes ring, right? And you, you go, oh, my god, you're killing my engine. OK? It's those, that kind of knowledge, that, those tacit forms of knowledge that bedevil all attempts at centrally planning, whether it's an entire economy or an industry or the money supply or whatever it might be. And again, we don't need to assume evil here when mere ignorance will suffice. The Fed simply can't track the variables it needs to track. But there's also a second set of problems, right? What we generally would call public choice problems. E putting aside those knowledge problems, do actors within the Federal Reserve even have the right incentives to get the job done the way we'd like? If they can't figure out what the demand for money is, does that make it more likely they'll, they'll, they'll act more intensely on their self-interest? Why does the Fed tend to make mistakes to err in favor of inflation rather than deflation? You'd think if, they were, if there was no self-interest involved, they just should be wrong on one side or the other more randomly. But maybe inflation is in the central bank's central, central bank's self-interest, right? In fact, it is, right? If you, could, if you could run a printing press and spend it, you'd spend it, right? You wouldn't be out there grabbing money out of people's hands. Right? You'd be spending it. Okay? And in a way, that's, that's the key. Plus, when the Fed inflates, it, when central banks in general inflate, it reduces the value of government debt, and so they have an incentive as agents of the government to do that. So between those knowledge problems and those public choice problems, it's very difficult to imagine central banks doing the job we'd like them to do. This is all exacerbated by the economists talk about policy lags, right? We talk about that it takes time. A central bank, even if it's trying to do the right thing, right? It has to recognize there's a problem. It has to get data on what that problem is. It has to decide what to do based on that data. It has to implement that decision. And then that decision takes time to become effective. And by the time central banks react through this political decision-making process, the thing that was, might have been the right thing to do when the problem started might be the exact wrong thing to do now. And so what we get, instead of, you know, we have a business cycle like this, instead of the Fed or a central bank making those smaller, they start increasing the amplitude. They start becoming pro-cyclical instead of anti-cyclical. So that's another set of problems that central banks face. The way I sometimes like to analogize this, okay, is that cent cent central banking is sort of like the following. Suppose you're in a dark room with no lights whatsoever, and you drop an earring, okay? Central banks, if we say what central banks should do is track the, the demand for money, asking them to do that is like you trying to find that earring in a dark room, right? Imagine yourself trying to crawl around on the floor and search for that earring, okay? At some point, by the way, what are you going to start doing while you're doing that? Dark room. You're in your living room. Yeah, knocking things over, slamming your head into the furniture, right? At some point, what are you likely to say? The hell with it. Well, all right. I can imagine a few things you'd be saying, bumping your head into the furniture. But at some point, you know, I can say, forget it. It's not worth it, right? I'm just not going to bother searching for the earring anymore. I'm just going to stand, I'm just going to give up and stand still. And in a way, 
That, those two options are a way of thinking about one of the great debates over monetary policy. The first position is what, when economists talk about giving the central bank discretion, is like looking for that earring in the dark room. But what we frequently wind up arguing is if you let the Fed or a central bank try to do that, they'll keep bumping into the furniture. That is, they'll keep making these pro-cyclical mistakes. So it might be better to just tie the central bank's hands and say, don't do anything at all. And you can think about that as a, a, a fixed monetary growth rule that people like Milton Friedman, at least early in his career, proposed. The problem with the fixed growth rule, what's the problem with standing around not doing anything in the dark room? You don't find the earring. That's right. OK? What's the obvious solution to this problem? So who said turn on the lights? Turn on the lights, right. We need to turn on the lights. We need some way of being able to figure out where that earring is. And one way of thinking about the alternatives to central banking is that they are the market, what markets do, what competition does, is turn on the lights, okay? It allows people to see better, to get better knowledge, better information through market prices and other market mechanisms about where, that, where the earring is, where, where, where the demand for money is. And so there have been, uh, over time, a number of various proposals, uh, alternatives to central banking that have been proposed. I'm only going to talk about one of these today, okay? And in the Q&A, you can raise, you know, if you have other ones you want to talk about, you can raise those in the Q&A. What I'm going to talk about is what's known as free banking. And again, not to be confused with the historical free entry in banking system. This is what, what's called free banking, okay? And the argument that people have made for this system, and I, myself included also um, Professor White, who's now a faculty member here in the economics department, who is one of the first people to make this, this kind of argument. Um, imagine a system in which individual banks issue not only deposits, but also paper currency. That instead of a central bank issuing the paper currency, individual banks issue it. Those individual banks make both their deposits and their currency redeemable in some what we call outside money, some other kind of money. It is, would likely be a commodity money and would likely be gold, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, okay? But I'm going to assume for the sake of argument in the next couple minutes that it's gold. These banks would also, by the way, be fractional reserve banks. I'm happy to entertain this discussion in the Q&A afterwards, but let me pause for a minute to talk about this. Um, let me put it bluntly. There's nothing wrong with fractional reserve banking, despite what you might have heard in various criticisms uh, of central banking. Fractional reserve banking under central banking creates problems, not because of the fractional reserve part, because of the central bank part. There have been plenty of examples that I'll mention later on of free or free-ish banking systems with fractional reserves that operated just fine. They weren't inflationary. They weren't subject to bank runs. Okay? There's a whole other argument about fractional reserve banking being fraudulent, but that's a different, that's a different question. Free banking systems like this would run on fractional reserves just like our own, system, our own system does, okay? The problem with fractional reserves comes in when you have a government monopoly over the reserves and limits on the kinds of things that banks can do. Such a free banking system would be treated no differently than any other market. Enforce the contracts that, people, that are made by consenting adults as consumers and producers. Allow banks to operate fully nationwide. Allow banks to choose their own reserve levels and allow banks to decide what commodities and what other assets will, ba will back the currency and the deposits they issue. Under such a system, banks would compete to supply the money that people wish to hold. And for those banks, the profit maximizing point turns out to be where they supply just the amount of money that their customers wish to hold, either in their bank accounts or as currency in their pockets. If those banks create too much money, what happens? People have more money than they wish to hold. That is possible, by the way, right? Don't confuse money and wealth, right? You can never be too wealthy, but you can have too much money. You can have too much of your wealth in the form of money, right? Every day, every, like I get paid twice a month. First thing I do when I get paid is pay a whole bunch of bills, right? Because for that moment, I've got too much money. I, what I don't have is enough cell phone, <laughs> enough mortgage, enough all these other things, right? And so I turn my money into those other things. So you can have too much money. And when you have too much money, you tend to spend it. And what happens if, the, if banks create more money than their customers wish to hold under the system is the customers spend it. And eventually those, that money, whether deposits or currency, make their way back to the bank that's overdone it and drains away their gold or their other, their other reserves. That threatens them with a liquidity crisis, which is big trouble for them. And that will hurt their profits. What about banks that create too little money? 
Banks that create too little money suffer an opportunity cost. They are sacrificing the interest they could be making if they were loaning that additional money into, into existence. So banks who overissue run a risk, a, a cost of illiquidity. Banks that underissue run a cost of, of an opportunity cost of, 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 of interest they could be earning. And so it turns out, you can sort of demonstrate this you know, technically, that minimizing those joint costs or maximizing profit turns out to be when banks, when these banks create exactly the amount of money that their customers wish to hold. We've seen historically systems close to this in Scotland, in Canada, and other places. And again, the results were very good. Very few bank failures, general macroeconomic stability, they didn't suffer from inflation and all these, or deflation, all these other kinds of problems. Even in the United States, you know, I, I po pointed to some problems with the national banking system, and there were problems with those recurring panics. But that system was actually pretty good at avoiding monetary instability in terms of inflation and deflation. What we saw during most of the end of the 19th century in the United States were gently falling prices, which was good because as the economy was getting more productive, we were producing things more efficiently, prices should, should in fact fall. And that system was in some ways uh, like, uh, like a free banking system. We had competitive production of money, although with those regulations that caused those, those problems. So this kind of system, I would argue, is, a, is an alternative to free banking, or to central banking. And this free banking system, what's interesting about it, I think, as we make the case against central banking, is it's not so strange. It's not bizarre. It simply it's, it has features of banking systems we've had in the past that other countries have had, and it looks a lot like our own. We still have Chase and Citibank and all these, con all these banks issuing deposits. They just be issuing currency, too. And by the way, the advent of the debit card Right, has meant that currency isn't even all as important as it used to be, uh, unless you're you know, spending money on something you don't wish other people to know you're spending it on. Uh, you know, that can cover lots of things. Um, but the, the anonymity of currency still has, has power in, in certain markets for illegal substances. All right? But for the most part, I, I hold much less currency than I used to. So even there, we're already moving towards this kind of system by being able to substitute away from currency into our bank accounts, which are, in fact, privately produced money. Don't forget that. Your checking account is privately produced money. So free banking is not this major exotic sort of thing. So the bottom line of this whole talk, I think, is that the failures of socialism and planning across the globe over the course of the last century are because of the same problems that plague central banks in miniature. Just as that economic planning came about because people had certain ideological beliefs about the problems with markets and the power of central management, because they misunderstood the nature of problems in the market economy, usually caused by existing government problems, and they had their own self-interest at stake, all of those came together to lead people to believe that central planning was a good thing. These are the same sorts of things that led people to think central banking was a good thing. We know now that markets are the solution, that markets work better than central planning in general, same thing is true for banking. Critics might point to the current recession as evidence against the power of markets, but the reality is the current recession is one of the best cases ever against central banking. The Fed caused these problems from the start, and they're only making matters worse right now. So to return to my opening theme, we don't need craziness and nut jobbery when history and theory make the case against central banking all by themselves. The history of the Fed is no different in its essentials than that of many other government interventions, especially the ones that came out of the progressive era. Since its creation, it hasn't done the job very well, and there are alternatives out there that can do the job better, both in theory and in practice. We know from history that systems like free banking can work. So the answer to the question is no, we really don't need a central bank. We never have. But bad economic history, bad economic theory, and self-interest conspired to give us one. And it's time to get good monetary history and good economic theory back into this conversation and try to override, if we possibly can, the self-interest of both bankers and politicians and restore some sanity to the U.S. monetary system. The Fed never should have been created, and its track record is one of consistent failure. Now's the time for a really radical reform, getting rid of the Fed, getting rid of central banks, and letting the market produce money. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I know there's a couple microphones around.
Uh, Dr. Horwitz, <coughs> do you think that the Fed's dual mandate causes a lot of problems and that maybe one of the first things to do, even if you're against the central bank completely, is to get it out of dealing with employment or with the, the economy in general and just keeping it uh, relegating to, to prices? Yeah, the dual mandate that he's referring to is the idea that the Fed is responsible both for keeping inflation in check and for producing full employment. And I, I mean, I think that's a, that would be a helpful step, I think, would be to say to the Fed, stop worrying about full employment, just worry about monetary stability. The problem, of course, is it still faces all the problems we've talked about, which is uh, that, that inflation is still in its self-interest, even outside of the full employment context, just from a you know, monetizing the debt, debt reduction context. Uh, and it still faces the knowledge problems in terms of getting that job done. So would it, I mean, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt, I think, to get, to get the full employment piece out of that puzzle. By the way, that's only since 1945, right? Before 1945, the Fed's mandate, if it even really had a mandate, essentially was, was you know, keep, don't, don't let us have panics, which it basically allowed to happen, you know, happen anyway. So yeah, I mean, that, that couldn't hurt. It would help a little bit, um, but I don't think it really gets to the core, the core of the problem. Uh, Dr. Horowitz, uh, a lot of people think that the most recent financial crisis has caused by over-the-counter derivatives, uh, speculation, a lot of these unregulated areas of banking. And personally, I just don't see how we can prevent these things without some kind of regulator, whether it be a f federal bank, a uh, central bank, or some other agency. Because it seems to me that the banks that went bust and had the biggest kind of uh, negative externality were those that were the least regulated. Could you care to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, let me say I, I could do another half hour on that, but I won't. Um, but let me actually let me do the shortcut, which is uh, as actually within the last couple days, the Foundation for Economic Education uh, has released uh, a, a short pamphlet uh, that uh, myself and Pete Betke, who's here today as well, wrote for them. Uh, it's called The House That Uncle Sam Built. Not our title, but that's okay. Uh, the House that Uncle Sam built, which is uh, a, a, an attempt to explain the causes of the Great Recession of 2008, uh, jargon-free, layman's terms. Uh, I, I don't know if it's here or not, but the, the Foundation for Economic Education has one of these on the Great Depression, written by their current president, Larry Reed. So that's a good. It's online if you the House that Uncle Sam built, or go. I think the front page of the Fee website, at least earlier today, had a link to it right there. You'll find it. Um, that will do more than I can do in a couple minutes to respond to that question. Uh, so just a couple things. Um, it's, it, it's true uh, that some of these fancy derivative type instruments were less regulated than other kinds of f financial instruments at the time, often because they were simply new and folks didn't, didn't know what to do with them. Um, nonetheless, it's not true that they were completely unregulated. Uh, there were all kinds of regulations still in place, though arguably less so than in other, other, other cases. But what I'd want to do is back up the story a bit and ask ourselves where, how we got all that fancy stuff in the first place. And the reason we had all those fancy mortgage-backed securities and then the derivatives based on the mortgage-backed securities has to do a ton with both the Fed having fueled the, the, the expansion of the money supply uh, and then fuel, provided the fuel for uh, the increase in lending to the housing market and the rise of housing prices, um, as well as a whole bunch of other government interventions in the housing market that, uh, may, that produced the whole secondary mortgage market. We wouldn't have that huge secondary mortgage market if Fannie and Freddie didn't exist, government-sponsored enterprises, and we certainly wouldn't have it if they didn't have the implicit government guarantee that they had that they would never be allowed to fail. So Fannie and Freddie were buying up all these mortgages, and the banks were saying, well, look, no one will let them fail. Let's get it off our books, let them buy it up. And once they bought it up and turned it into these various instruments, then the game's on. So it's, it's true, you're right, that those, were, those instruments were less regulated, but it's not clear that all those instruments would have even existed but for, as the lawyers would say, uh, these, other kinds of, these other kinds of interventions. So saying to say, well, the recession is, is the fault of the, the lighter regulation of those instruments and that we need uh, a central bank of some sort as a, as, a, as a way to solve the problem, I think misses the fact that the central bank was at the core of the reason we had those in the first place right, number one, and it was other regulations that contributed to it as well. Um, I'm also not sure at all that it was the banks who were, the, 
The banks that failed were ones not just dealing with the fancy instruments per se, or, or the less regulated instruments, though there were certainly some of those, because some of those banks failed, some got bailed out, some, you know, some were wise, wise enough to stay away. Um, I, there were banks that failed for a whole bunch of reasons, often because they held those instruments, not so much because they created them or originated them or, 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 or anything like that. They simply bought them as investments. The other point I'd make is that why would people rate these things AAA? Right? That's a really good question. Why were all these really crappy instruments rated AAA? And one reason is, is that the ratings agency were a government-sponsored cartel. The federal government, the SEC specifically, had, had made it the case that only three ratings agencies could have could, had the official power to rate these kinds of securities. And without real competition in that market, those agencies quickly became, you know, sort of suffered a kind of Stockholm syndrome, right, and became captured by the banks themselves as opposed to dealing with the customers. And so they began to, you know, the, the banks would begin to agency shop for better ratings, and those ratings became, as we now know for sure, unreliable. Um, but that's not a failure of regulation. That's a fail, that, I mean, that's not a failure of markets. That's a failure of regulation, of an attempt to, to sort of create that, you know, that, that triopoly, I guess you'd call it, that cartel. So I think there's another, another narrative that one can tell that really does look at the role that government regulation played in generating these, these instruments and, and in, in enabling them to do the damage that they did. Did bankers make bad decisions? Yep. Uh, but oftentimes, not all, not all of them, but many of those decisions were bad decisions because the signals they faced were bad, not because they weren't sufficiently regulated, not because bankers were irrational or stupid, but because the signals they faced were bad. The analogy that we use in that pamphlet, and, and then I'm going to move on to another question. The analogy we use is this. Suppose while we've been in here the last hour or so, and we get out of here, um, you've you know, checked your BlackBerry or flipped on the news and discovered that in the District of Columbia while we were here, there were 3,000 automobile accidents in that hour. Now what would you assume? Would you assume that somehow the drivers in the district suddenly went berserk? Right or got irrational, right? So what would you? What would be the more likely explanation? I, I heard mumble. Someone say it. Pretend it's class. Traffic, Traffic lights are out. Right. Traffic lights. I mean, imagine every light in the district went green. Oops. Right. A few thousand automobile accidents would be likely. Right. When the signals that investors were facing were not reflecting risk accurately or not reflecting people's real desire to save or buy houses. It's not surprising that we see them make investments at ex post turn out to be irrational. But again, if those, if those bad signals are the result of the Fed or other government intervention, then it's hard to say that, that deregulation or that markets are the problem. Um, let me move on to another question, but we can certainly talk about this more after if you like. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're speaking about this. I had a couple of questions, actually. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate you on maintaining sort of an academic tone, despite the fact that you were stereotyping a whole bunch of people and calling them all racist with the whole Jewish New World Order conspiracy. That's, that's not very nice. I mean, when people like uh, Henry Kissinger talk about a New World Order, he's not Jewish. It, it, it's, it's not something I want to see happen, obviously, but I don't, I don't blame a race of people for, for using that kind of uh, rhetoric from a couple of powerful uh, individuals. First off, I'd like to say, uh, why is it um, hard to believe that bankers uh, don't know that war is actually good for their business? I think that's one of the things. They know that it's good for their business. Yeah, they do. I agree. You know, and, and having a war really does help them out a lot. Yeah. So it might be in their vested interest to maybe help foment or push towards war in a lot of situations. I, I, I think that is certainly quite possible, right? Um, that, that both both central bankers and other bankers, right, have, may have an interest in, I mean, look, let, let Horowitz's first law of political economy, no one hates capitalism more than the capitalists, right? So, so it's not surprising at all that we'd see bankers think that expansion of government in all kinds of forms, including the military, was, was within their, was, a thing, was something that, that would be in their self-interest. Well, that, that's absolutely true, and I'd like to also say, isn't the uh, American racial hygiene movement or eugenics also the result of this whole progressivist yep. mentality as well? I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why these things get lumped together is because they were all part of the same scientific push towards unity. I mean, it's not necessarily something that we face on an everyday scale today, but it certainly was back when you were living in the South and, and you were considered to be racially unhygienic. You know, that's, 
you know, that was a serious, you know, claim back then. So I'd also like to say, the, isn't the Bank of England one of the main shareholders in the Federal Reserve Bank? And no. Um, no. You don't think no. so? No. It's just, that's just, that's false. The, 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 look, the 12 district banks are owned, the shares in those banks are owned by the member banks in those districts. There are no shares in the Federal Reserve. There's no overarching thing that has shares in it. All the national, all the federal level, we, what we have is the Federal Reserve Board and the FOMC. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors, right? Right, but that's that's not it. That, there's no shares in that. Those are those. That's that's uh, people in an office. Lots right. of people, lots of offices. But well, I could get into a whole other, other thing on that. But anyways, I was just going to say you should also include the Napoleonic era, um, using the Rothschild example as one of the reasons why we should avoid central banking because. What uh, Nathan de Rothschild did back then in relation to the Napoleonic Wars really did have an eventual result on central banking worldwide. Uh, there's, look, there, there's, there's no doubt at all that there's this historical connection between bankers, war, and central banking. And in fact, for me, one of the most powerful arguments against central banks is that they're instruments of war and, and always have been, going that far back and, and farther back. But, but those, that relationship crosses national, uh, ethnic, racial boundaries. It's just a universal phenomenon. And when we talk, when people start to talk about these issues in those kind of terms, they're just, it, there's no historical evidence to support it. it the problems are not, the, the problems are universal problems of political economy. And, and I think that's, that's the, that was my, my point, okay? And my, my point at, by my starting point was not to uh, stereotype every single uh, you know, opponent of central banking as being, quote unquote, a nut job. Um, the reality is many of them are, or were at least historically. And their arguments were wrong. They were, th th they were right in opposing the central bank, but they were opposed it for reasons that were both historically incorrect and damaging to the cause. Okay? If you really think central banks are a problem, you got to get the arguments right. Otherwise, you're not going to be effective. And that's, that's the point I was trying to make. Other questions? Dr. Horvitz, what's the future for central banking for this country? Do you think Ron Paul's vision of ending the Fed is going to come to fruition? Yeah, what's the future of central, of, of, well, there's two questions. What's the future of central banking and then what's the future of the anti-central banking movement, right? I think those are two, two interesting, interesting questions. Um, I, let me put it this way. I, I'm, I'm shocked and pleasantly shocked by the events of the last couple years that have put the Fed front and center. I didn't, you know, I've been working on these issues since I was in graduate school 20 whatever years ago, and, and there's never been anything like this, where people are actually talking about the central bank in the kinds of ways they're talking about it. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, I think that's great. I don't see that going away uh, in the near future. Whether it can be effective, however, is another question. Um, you can already see people circling the wagons. If you saw uh, Bernanke's op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, whatever it was, a couple days ago, right? Already, you know, sort of attacking, attacking his attackers, right? In all kinds of ways. Um, from what I know of the Ron Paul, the legislation, right? He now has a majority of votes, I think, to, to if he can, or close to it. So that might actually come to the floor at some point. And I think the audit and the transparency stuff, we we may well see that happen. Uh, and boy, that'll be one political brouhaha, the technical term for it, uh, when the, if, if that happens. Because I think, I think we'll find out all kinds of nasty stuff that wouldn't be surprising to critics of the Fed, but might be surprising to others in terms of the kind of things they've done and the kind of assets they've brought and so on. And, and I do think that the, the shrouding of the process of, of what the Fed does, that the fact that it's so shrouded in mystery and expertise you know, and all these sorts of things, um, I think now is being seen, now is going to damage its credibility. I hadn't thought about this till just this moment, but it's an interesting parallel with what the, 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 the climate gate emails, right, that we've seen come out. We're seeing the same problem there too, a lack of transparency, a lack of, a lack of, of, of clarity from so-called experts. And so I, I think it is certainly possible that what we'll see happen is, is that that that's a, it might be a tipping point, right? If that really happens, can, 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 the, can the, you know, criticism of the Fed catch on? Good question. But boy, we better be ready with some alternative, right? Uh, otherwise, it could get worse. So that's one. As far as the anti-central banking movement 
goes or anti-Fed movement. I, I mean, I think the, like the Fed rallies and the 22nd anti-Fed rallies, I, that stuff's great, okay? Um, and and I'm, I'm a cautious supporter of the Tea Party movement, too. Cautious, but a, but a supporter. And I think what has to happen is that those movements, all those things that are happening, need to hone in on the central issues. And the central issues are, 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 are out of control size of government and government spending, increased debt, and the danger of inflation. And if you can focus in on those three, that's because that's where you're going to get agreement among free market types, right? If you drag the social issues in, you're going to cleave off the libertarians and all these sort of things, right? Stay with those. And I think you can make the anti-Fed message part of that, as long as you keep it part of that, as long as you talk in terms of the Constitution, as long as you, talk, as long as you get your history and your theory right, right? That movement could have legs. I'm not sure it's going to, but it could if people did it right. So I'm, 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 as someone who has tried to get rid of central banks you know, for 25 years, there's never been a time when the Fed has looked softer than it looks, more ripe for the picking than it looks right now. Yeah. Dr. Horowitz, um, while we're asking you to forecast about the future, I want <laughs> to- Which Austrians are so good <laughs> To hear about your uh, take on the inflation versus deflation debate currently within uh, the Austrian camp. You hear both arguments that uh, with all this injection of capital in, in, into cash, into the uh, market by the Fed, you, you, we expect runaway prices, which we haven't yet seen. And right. some say with all the cancellation of uh, debt between all the major banks, we're going to see continued defla We're going to see deflation. I want to know what your take is on that argument. Oh, these issues are so complicated. Um, let me say a couple of things. I, as I said, I, I'm fairly fearful of inflation at the moment. Um, we do have the Fed last fall and since last fall massively expanded reserves. I mean, the, the climate hockey stick we now know is false, but the monetary base hockey stick is, <laughs> is true, okay? Uh, and and that, that money's out, that, those reserves are out there. They're sitting in banks. Banks are sitting on them for a variety of reasons, right? That's why we haven't seen the inflation happen yet, is that banks are still sitting on all those reserves. Uh, why are they sitting on them? One reason is the Fed started paying a small amount of interest on them, right? Interest rates are slow, so low, banks want to be liquid, that's a pretty good deal. Um, banks are still skittish about lending in the current environment, right? Investors are, cons are, are skittish about starting new projects in the current environment. So, so the, the threat of the time bomb is ticking, okay? Uh, but it's just ticking right now. So I'm more concerned about inflation. I don't see that the, the deflationary, when we talk about deflation, I got to separate two different things. There's, there's good and bad deflation, okay? Bad deflation is like what happened in the early 20s or the early 30s and late 20s, okay? The bad deflation is when you allow the money supply to drop and you just sort of the economy runs down the, runs down the drain. Good deflation is when prices fall because goods are becoming less scarce or because demand is shifting away from those goods into other goods. Look, it, 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 it's, it's, it's so funny, by the way, to see the news, right? The, 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 I keep saying that the bad news is the good news. Every time I see someone on the news say, housing prices fell again last month, I go, yay, right? They should be falling. They were ridiculously high, right? Or housing starts are down, yay. Right? Because we shouldn't be starting more houses. We should be doing other things. So when we're talking about deflation in certain asset prices, right, that's good. When we're talking about deflation because we're getting more productive, I can buy an LCD TV for a lot cheaper than I could two years ago, that, those things are good. So we are seeing some of that kind of deflation. At the same time, that bomb is ticking out there with all those reserves. What I, um, I'm going to plug two of my own pieces. I've got a piece coming out in the next issue of of the Freeman magazine on this deflation issue. It's called, I think the title is something like uh, Good Deflation, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, or something like that. Um, and then my, I have a column that will come out on Thursday, which is on the next thing I'm going to talk about, which is the, the problem the Fed faces right now, which is how does it have an exit strategy for getting all these excess reserves out? It, I don't think it does, and I'm not sure how it can. So I, I'm, I am significantly worried about inflation in the near future. Let me get to some folks I haven't heard from yet, and a couple in, in, back, in back there. Uh, yes, sir, you mentioned uh, three things we should address, uh, increasing debt, the inflation problem, and then uh, out-of-control government spending. 
uh, right now, I don't think any of those are at historical highs, uh, like uh, as compared to GDP. Uh, but some of them are, are broaching historic levels, yeah. especially during wartime, which we're not really in a war. It's more of a conflict. Uh, <laughs> Congress hasn't declared war since. Uh, 1941. I'm not sure that matters to the people over there, but okay. B right, mm -hmm. but uh, just to be technically technical about it. But anyway, is there is there some point you see where there'd be a breaking point or a point of no return mm -hmm. on those uh, figures that we should be uh, watchful for? I, I'm I'm if I knew, I wouldn't be here. I'd be out investing, you know, and making a mint off it. I I, I don't, I, I, there's no breaking, it seems to me there, there's no numerical breaking point. Can I point to, you know, a debt to GDP ratio beyond which we should all run for the hills? No. Okay. I mean, should, you know, I, I don't think you can do, be that precise. Um, I think we should worry, though, if it continues, you know, the more it grows, the more we should worry. We should particularly worry if we do see inflation start to really pick up, because that could, that could get us into a nasty spiral. Right, we're trying to fight the inflation. We do all kinds of bad things that make matters worse. So, so I mean, I, I, I you know, I can't give you a specific answer. Um, I think your your description is, I think, is, is right to some degree. Uh, those, I mean, the size of the federal government's never been bigger. The size of the annual deficit's never been bigger. But in terms of GDP, if you look historically, well, during some during some declared wars, you know, we've been we've been that high. So, or near that high. So again, how, it depends on how you want to how you want to measure it historically. At the same, you know, so so yeah, I think that's 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 enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I know I know there was another hand, the gentleman all the way in back. Or yeah, oh, yeah. Um, just uh, uh, regarding the inflation versus deflation mm -hmm. argument, um, I'm going to make a, a generalization. And think this is correct. Uh, I think in the worries of inflation have always been, ex or at least the uh, anxiety of inflation has, has always been unfounded or exaggerated, or deflation rather, has always been um, exaggerated, and the, the uh, problems of inflation have always been underestimated. Um, <laughs> I'm looking back at Weimar Germany, or current Zimbabwe, Yugoslavia in the 80s and 90s. Inflation is far more destructive economically, yes. politically, and culturally, morally, than deflation. And has there ever been an, a, an era where deflation has caused any serious damage? I'm not aware of any. Well, the Great Depression is the obvious example to that, right? I mean, you, you know, it, it, it's, a, we're, it's playing some counterfactual history, but the interesting question is what would the Great Depression, what, what would that period have looked like had the Fed not screwed up and allowed the money supply to fall by 30 percent? I mean, I, you know, I, I, one, one plausible story is we would have had uh, a, a, a severe but fairly short recession, but not, you know, a, dec a lost decade, okay? And certainly that, there changes that happened during the Great Depression. You can't attribute all the Great Depression to deflation, but it's a significant piece of why it was as bad as it was. And certainly that led to changes that had long run implications, I think many of them problematic. But that's about the best example we really have. I think the way you put it is exactly right, that people have feared tend to fear deflation too much, especially since they confuse the good and bad deflation, okay, and under, don't fear inflation enough in the sense that the damage done by inflation is, is much greater. I mean, inflation, uh, even with a deflation, at some point, market correction mechanisms kick in. It can often be after a long, painful decline. With inflation, there's the, the sky's the limit. Look at Zimbabwe, right? Um, you know, you you or the examples you mentioned, um, and those really do. Those those destroy the currency. They destroy the money. They de by destroying money, they destroy markets. By destroying markets, they destroy our ability to trade with each other peacefully, right? I mean, we we revert, you know, to to to, to less civilized behaviors, and so I think that, that 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 is a genuine fear. I mean, I think we should be more afraid of inflation than deflation in general, particularly because central bank every every country's got a central bank, and central banks will do anything in their power to avoid deflation, mainly because it hurts the very government to which they serve. So I think that's absolutely right. I'm back. Uh, yes, Dr. Horitz. Um, my question is actually nothing to do with the inflation or deflation, but how do we? How would you? I guess suggest getting the narrative out there mm. concerning free markets, free banking, the dangers that the se that a central banking poses to a governments and society, yeah. and avoid having it marginalized, such as the Tea Party movement. As yeah. you said, you cautiously support it, but avoid having the movement or the the education, the narrative, I guess, 
out there to the general public for their education and their consumption? Boy, that's those are all, these are always hard questions. I think you know again, if the tea if the Tea Party movement were done the way Horowitz thinks it should be done, you know the central planner, um, that would be one vehicle, right? Where you could you could use that as a platform to to continue to sort of call for uh, either you know end the Fed is short and sweet, but to you know open up the, the Fed. I mean, any of those steps are helpful. I think so that that's important. All right. I, I think uh, you know what can what can individuals do? You can write letters to the editor. You can participate in, in if you want to do the Tea Party type stuff. You can do that too. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get to get the word out. If you're on Facebook, link link to link to articles on the web that that make the case. You know, annoy your friends. Uh, you know, l d all these kind of things that you can do, right? That spread the word. And and I think the key is you know find presenting these arguments in the most calm, reasoned, sane way you can, that you're not a crazy person. You're concerned about the future of this country, right? You're concerned about the future of other countries. Um, and and this is, you, you, you've seen this problem. There's reasons we know it's a problem historically. We know what central banks are doing now. We know there's alternatives out there. They're not crazy. You know, it's, I think that's all you can do is keep, keep hammering away in, the, in whatever ways you, you are best able to. The time for maybe one, one or two more questions. Yeah, Steve, would you talk a little bit about Roosevelt's uh, nationalization of gold, what the purported rationale was, what the ramification were, and so <laughs> forth? Yeah, uh, well, Roosevelt and gold, there's a lot going on there. Um, the, argue, one, the, the, most, the most reasonable argument was that, um, that uh, the, only way, the only way to get out of the deflationary spiral that we were in was to reflate, and that what Roosevelt, are, what Roosevelt or, and his advisors, the best forward, face forward they put was to say, well, we have to, we have to break the link with gold to be able to produce the additional money we need. Uh, that gold was a fetter, to use the title of a, of a well-known book on the period, uh, that prevented us from, from getting out of the, the, the situation we were in. I think Friedman and Schwartz's work since then has demonstrated that that was not necessary. You, the Fed, even the Fed at the time, had the powers to get out of the trouble without breaking the link to gold. I also think at the same time, you know, Roosevelt and his brain trust had a bigger vision of reform that they wanted to enact that involved breaking that link and, and being able to use, manipulate the monetary system in, in other kinds of ways. So I think that's part of it. I think the scariest thing, I mean, this is a story from Amity Schley's wonderful book, uh, The Forgotten Man, which is a, hist a narrative history of the Great Depression. She tells a story about after Roosevelt broke the link with gold, it was within his power to set the price of gold every day, basically. And so one of the stories is, is that uh, his advisors came into him. He was in bed having breakfast one morning, and they said, Mr. President, what do you want to do with the price of gold today? And he said, let's increase it 21 cents. And they said, why, why 21 cents? And he says, well, that's a lucky number. Okay, and that's okay. Here you have the triumph of discretion <laughs> over rules, right? And here's Roosevelt setting the price of gold by lucky numbers, right? And so the damage that that might have done at the time, you know, is, is a real problem. I mean, th this was a case where people thought that, th that, that the, the gold standard was an anachronism. It was a fetter. It was a rule that prevented us from, from being able to, to, to direct the economy in the ways that those folks thought they should. Um, and, and, uh, and so they were willing to break it to... to among other reasons, to, to have that kind of control that they needed. I don't know, does that, the, does that answer for you? I think we're good. Thank you all very much.